Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The appointed hour has arrived. It is now 7 p.m. on Tuesday, July 10th in the year 2018, and this public hearing will come to order. I want to welcome you on behalf of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service formal public hearing on the proposal to replace the existing regulations governing the non-essential experimental population of the red wolf in eastern North Carolina. My name is Linda McCown. I'm the principal attorney at McCown & McCown and my office is located here in Manio. I was asked by the Fish and Wildlife Service to conduct this public hearing. I am here to conduct the public hearing and provide an independent and impartial presence. I am not involved in the decision process and my role in this proposal ends when the public hearing is over. My obligation to the Fish and Wildlife Service and to you, the public, is fourfold. That is, to maintain order, to maintain a friendly and non-hostile environment, to keep speakers to the allotted time limits, and to ensure each of you have a fair and equal opportunity to be heard. I would like to introduce the panel tonight. On my immediate right is Pete Benjamin, and Pete is the Fish and Wildlife Service Field Supervisor in Raleigh, North Carolina. To his right is Joe Madison, who is the program manager for the Fish and Wildlife Services North Carolina Red Wolf Non-Essential non Experimental Population in the Maniote Field Office. To my left is Michelle Everson. Michelle is the Ecological Services Program Supervisor for the Services Regional Office in Atlanta, Georgia. The proceedings tonight will be recorded by a court stenographer. Her name is Bria Pintado. And if any of you want a copy of the transcript, you have to make private arrangements, but you would have to pay for it. In the event you have an interest, her telephone number is 757-303-9218. The script will eventually be available to the public online. If you want the script before it is available online, please contact Bria. This hearing is an open public meeting. The service had requests from citizens to film this meeting and possibly share what they film. And we are following the law and giving them permission to film. The service cannot restrict this filming. This evening is divided into three parts. I'm going to give you a short discussion of the ground rules. Then there will be a short presentation on the proposed regulation. And we will then launch into the major portion, which is the public comment portion. When you come to the microphone, please state your name clearly and spell it for the stenographer. That way she can get it all down on the record correctly. You have to be registered in order to speak. The registration cards are out on the welcome table that is at the Grand Hall and Observation Deck. I think you have all probably seen the cards, but unless you have filled one out, you will not be allowed to speak. I will call you to the microphone in the order the cards were turned in. Lending and borrowing time is not allowed. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife will be taking cards until 9 p.m. Time is short. There will be a five minute, zero second speaking allocation per speaker. Of course, you don't have to speak the full five minutes, but you certainly may. Phil Cloer, public affairs specialist with the Services Regional Office in Atlanta, Georgia, will be our designated timekeeper. Phil will operate an automatic timer to my left that activates the green, yellow, and red lights here and on a smaller device on the podium. The larger light will be green during the majority of your five minute, um, zero second speaking time, and the talk light on the podium device will be lit with the exception of the last 30 seconds. The last 30 seconds, it will show yellow to alert you and the sum up light on the podium device will light up indicating that it is time to wrap up. At the end of your time allocation, the light will turn red and the stoplight on the podium device um, will turn on. If you go over your allotted time by more than 10 seconds, there will be a flashing red light and a series of beeps. We do not expect you to stop in the middle of a sentence. You certainly can complete your sentence, but we do not want you to continue on in a long dialogue. That means wrap it up and leave the microphone. I would like to tell you what this is tonight and what it is not. This is an opportunity for all of you to register your thoughts and your comments on the proposed federal action that would make changes to replace the existing regulations governing the non-essential experimental population in eastern North Carolina 
of the Red Wolf under Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act. We also, we are interested in your comments on the draft environmental assessment for the proposed action. What it is not is a court proceeding. Although it is a formal federal public hearing and the demeanor will be the same as that of a courtroom, there will be no testimony under oath, there is no cross-examination. It is also not a debate, not a debate between the audience and the Fish and Wildlife Service, nor between members of the audience. There is no rebuttal and there is no second shot at the apple. It is not a question and answer session. Now there was an information session held earlier today, an opportunity to ask questions. However, this is a formal hearing and not a question and answer session. This is designed to afford you the opportunity to voice your comments and for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff to gain information from you as to your view of its draft environmental assessment and proposed regulation. You can, ask a, you can ask a question, but the question will not be answered here. It will be recorded by the stenographer and it will be recorded as a concern. The reviewers who review this transcript and the materials will take that concern under consideration at the time of review and substantive comments will be addressed in the final rule. The only exception to this is something really goes to the essence of the hearing. In that case, we will try to provide a short answer. You do not have to speak even though you have registered. If you find people before you have, at, before you have adequately covered your concerns or comments and you do not feel a need to speak, step forward and do not feel a need to step forward and speak, you can relinquish at that time. You do not have to come forward. You can supplement your oral arguments with written comments. You can give those to us tonight at any time and we will be happy to receive them. Written comments will be posted to the web portal. For your convenience, a comment form is available at the welcome table. You can also send in written comments at any time up and through July 30th, 2018. The federal e-rulemaking portal and ma mailing addresses will be on the screen so you can jot them down and are also available at the registration tables. Please note that the comments and information submitted during the public comment period receive equal consideration regardless of the manner submitted. Oral comments and information will be given the same level of consideration as written comments received via the other methods during open comment period. We ask that you not applaud, not make loud noises, and I direct you not to ridicule any, ridicule any of the speakers. Civility and courtesy are the watchwords tonight. We recognize that there are emotional aspects to the proposed regulation, but we remind you that not all speakers are experienced and some may be nervous. Some possibly would not come forward and speak in a hostile atmosphere, and we do not want anyone to be intimidated. We want every single person to be able to come comfortably to the microphone and give us their comments. In addition, loud noises and the like use up valuable time and the court reporter cannot hear and make a proper transcript. These ground rules are necessary to guarantee everyone a fair and equal opportunity to be heard and we will enforce the ground rules. Having said all this, we are now ready to start with the presentation. Thank you, uh, Linda. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I am uh, Pete Benjamin, as Linda said. I'm going to make a, uh, just a short presentation, give you a very um, uh, sort of cursory uh, review of why we're here tonight, uh, what the proposed rule is, because the main, uh, my main job here tonight is to uh, listen to what you all have to say. So I do not intend to uh, uh, drone on and on. Um, first, a little bit about the red wolf, a little, a little history. Uh, historically, the red wolf occurred throughout the southeast United States. Um, it was hunted to near extinction um, in the, by the uh, late 60s. The last uh, wild wolf population is this little red spot here in uh, uh, eastern Texas, western Louisiana. Uh, the decision was taken in the early 70s to bring the remaining wolves into captivity. Uh, it was added to the endangered species list in the late 60s, the predecessor to the modern Endangered Species Act. Uh, captive breeding program was started at Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington. 
the animal was considered extinct in the wild by the late 70s, uh, uh, 1980. Um, it was reintroduced into the wild here in eastern North Carolina on the Albemarle Peninsula in 1987. That's the first time an effort like that had been under, undertaken, the reintroduction of a predator to the wild. So this predates uh, the work done in Yellowstone with gray wolves and, and elsewhere with other carnivores. This was the first of its kind operation. Oh, I want to go back for a second. The, the black dots here on the map are uh, where we have uh, partner facilities around the country, over 40 institutions, that manage the captive program, what we call the Species Survival Plan, or the SSP. You might hear me use that tonight. Uh, uh, over 40 great institutions and partners that maintain the captive population. A little bit about the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it's very complicated federal law. I'm not going to bore you for a lot of details. Uh, but Section 10J of the Endangered Species Act is the part of the act that allows us to establish these experimental populations. Um, members of an experimental population are considered threatened uh, under the act, which means they don't receive all the protections that an endangered species uh, receives. We, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, determine by rule the specific protections, management measures, uh, other provisions that need to apply to manage uh, that uh, experimental population. Section 10J of the Act is there to facilitate uh, reintroductions. When you're reintroducing endangered species into an area where they don't currently occur, particularly an endangered predator, uh, local communities, local landowners, uh, local businesses can have concerns. And Section 10J is designed to help us write rules to uh, facilitate those reintroductions and address concerns related to reintroduction efforts. A little bit more history about the red wolf uh, population here in eastern North Carolina. We established the rules, first set of rules for this population in 1986. The first wolves were released in 1987, right here at Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. That set of rules, the 1986 rules, required that if wolves left the refuge, uh, we were to go out and capture them and either return them to the refuge or return them to captivity. Now the rule, uh, uh, for what it was, uh, worked. The wolves survived. They were able to establish territories, uh, uh, have puppies, uh, behave like wolves, feed themselves. So to that extent, it was a tremendous su success. The provisions of the rules that required us to go out and catch them and return them to the refuge when they left really didn't work. The, the wolves, we learned about a lot about wolves in the early days. They, they needed a lot more room than um, uh, we thought they would need. They wandered a lot farther. Uh, a lot of wolves were leaving the refuges, uh, refuge, and it became uh, uh, that part of the rule proved ineffective. So we've, we've made some uh, uh, tweaks to the rules over the years, but there, um, uh, and for a while, we had a population, uh, a second experimental population in the Smoky Mountains uh, of uh, eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina. Uh, that population did not do as well as the uh, wolves here in eastern North Carolina, mostly because there was, there was not uh, nearly as many uh, deer in the mountains as there are out here. Uh, but we made major revisions to the rules affecting this population in 1995. Uh, and the, some of the main differences were is that we removed the requirement that wolves that left the refuge be captured and returned. Uh, but to address landowner concerns about wolves on the property, the 1995 rules do provide that if you are a landowner, you do not want there to be wolves on your property, we will try to remove them. And if our, we abandon our efforts to remove them, we can issue uh, authorizations for landowners to take wolves. Those are, the, those are the provisions of the 95 rule. Um, and those are the rules that are in effect today. Uh, other things about the 95 rule, uh, it, it doesn't address coyotes at all. When the 95 rules were written, um, coyotes were still very rare in this part of the uh, world. 
Uh, Alligator River was selected as a reintroduction site back in the 80s because there were no coyotes here at that time. In the interim, coyotes moved in. That created really two uh, complications for red wolf management. One, red wolves and coyotes uh, can and do interbreed. And we needed to develop, and we have over the years, a lot of techniques to manage that, to manage interactions between wolves and coyotes. Uh, but the other thing that happened was that when coyotes became really established, landowners started to become more and more concerned about the potential impacts of coyotes on their property and um, uh, started really uh, you know, taking more actions to try to manage coyotes. And at that point, the wolf became perceived as more of an obstacle for landowners trying to manage their land in the way they felt they needed to. Our 1995 rules don't address coyotes at all or landowner concerns about coyotes because they weren't concerned when those rules were written. So in that sense, the 90, uh, 1995 rule really isn't doing or dealing with the issues that face the Red Wolf and the program today and the, the, the residents of the Albemarle. This graph just kind of illustrates what I'm talking about a little bit. It's population trends over time. The uh, black line, the top line, is the uh, captive population. You can see it's, it's hovering right around 200, 220 animals. That's due to just the space constraints within our partner facilities. But this line here has been the North Carolina population through time. And you can see it was around in the, in the mid-2000s, 2005 or so, after coyotes really became established in the area, that red wolf population uh, peaked and, uh, and, and begun to decline and has been in, in fairly sharp decline in the recent years. So what we're, so what we're trying to do with the rule here, the, the rule we're here that we've proposed, put in the Federal Register, and we're talking about tonight, is to try to address some of these challenges we're facing uh, with uh, uh, dealing with interactions between red wolves and coyotes and addressing landowners' concerns. That historic range map I showed you, the southeast United States is 90% private land. If the Red Wolf's going to recover and, uh, and thrive again, it's going to happen on private land. So we have to find a way to make it work for landowners. So the rule tonight replaces the 1995 rule uh, that we're proposing. Uh, focus, f focuses federal management on Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge and uh, Dare County Bombing Range. Kind of back to that original footprint. It does incorporate all the things we've learned over the years that we, need to, we know we need to do to manage wolves, our adaptive management plan, including the releases of wolves from captivity uh, to, to supplement the wild population, and the other techniques we've developed over the years to manage interactions between wolves and coyotes. So all that would be authorized by this rule. And it does remove the um, requirement for landowners to seek authorization from the Fish and Wildlife Service before they take wolves on non-federal lands. So that's the rule in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it than that. Obviously, I'm giving you a very brief uh, summary. I hope you do uh, take time, if you haven't already. I know a lot of you have, uh, to, uh, to look at the rule in its entirety, our environmental uh, draft environmental assessment that we've prepared, other supporting information about red wolves. And that's available on our website. A little bit about the process. Linda gave you a good overview of, of how we're going to do this tonight. But we're taking uh, public comments tonight. Uh, we're also taking uh, written comments. And I'll, I have a slide here in a minute to show you how, how to do that. A um, few handouts here. Um, this little card that's available out front has information on how you uh, submit written comments. Um, this, is the sp this is the speaker card that uh, uh, Linda referred to, if you want to make a statement here tonight, please fill out one of these cards uh, and get it to us if you haven't already done so. And if you want to provide written comments tonight, not everybody's comfortable public speaking, we have these forms also out there. You can uh, uh, provide written comments and give those to us tonight as well. Uh, the public comment period is open until July 30th. Uh, when that wraps up, we're going to take all the information that we've gathered at the hearing tonight and the written comments we've received and analyze that and move towards producing a final rule by the end of the calendar year. Uh, 
So none of the provisions in this proposed rule are obviously effective until such time as we finalize that rule in whatever form it takes. A um, couple things. So we're, we're interested, you know, tonight's about us hearing, hearing your thoughts uh, on the rule. We're interested in, in what you have to say. Uh, know that it's a couple things to keep in mind as you, as you formulate your comments. It's, it's not a vote. It's important for us to know, you know, folks are, are, are opposed or against. Uh, but what, we, what really helps make the uh, process move and make the uh, federal government's decisions better are substantive, uh, uh, concrete, actionable sorts of comments. Information that we've missed, that we've left out of the rule. Things that we've not considered and that, that you feel we should. Uh, other uh, options, ideas that uh, you think merit evaluation and consideration. Those are things that, that really help uh, improve the process. So um, this, I'm going to leave this up while the, while the uh, 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 comments are being given, just so you have it. Here, it's the same information that's on, uh, on this card, so you know how to uh, provide comments. Uh, you can do it online. You can do it uh, by mail. Uh, we'll take them any way uh, we can get them. And puppies are adorable. So with that, I will stop talking and turn it back over to Linda. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start the oral comments portion. As I said before, you must be registered to speak. And you may supplement your oral comments with written comments. If you've registered to speak but have changed your mind, you do not have to speak. And donating time is not permitted. You each will have five minutes to speak. During the last 30 seconds of your allotted time, the light will turn yellow, indicating it's time to wrap up. And at the end of your time, the light will turn red, followed by a flashing red and a series of beeps will be heard. I'm going to call two people at a time, someone for the podium and a backup speaker. We ask that the backup speaker sit in the probably right, the row right, see where that lady's pointing, <laughs> holding her hand up right there, right beside the podium. And be ready to speak when called. That way you do not waste time with speakers coming up and down the aisles. And with that, I will call the first speaker, Mike Bryant, and behind him for the backup speaker, Katrina Shipley. My name is Mike Bryant, M-I-K-E-D-R-Y-A-N-T, and I represent the National Wildlife Refuge Association. I was uh, formerly the refuge manager for Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge from 1996 to 2016, so I have familiarity with the Red Wolf program. But the service has said, despite the increased flexibility of a not a central population, that a 10-J rule must ensure that the reintroduction will further the conservation of the red wolf. It is the, the uh, position of the Refuge Association uh, that it doesn't. Neither the current application of the current 10-J rule or the proposed 10-J rule. This proposed rule change dramatically shrinks the NEP management area and by approximately 90%. And red wolves, when going off this land, would be subject to being killed at will by the public. Ostensibly, this huge shrinkage of land base changes the population from a self-sustaining population to a population that's called a propagation population. I'm familiar with a propagation population with the service, they had island propagation sites where they could control exactly uh, what animals they were putting on the island. There was no immigration or emigration of animals from the island typically. They knew the genetics of the animals going on. They knew the genetics of the pups coming off. It was to raise pups in the wild whose genetics they knew that could be used to supplement this population. It, I, we feel the service can't achieve their goal and by calling this a propagation population by shrinking it and shrinking the area because there's too little control over the individuals on 200,000 acres. 
uh, to ensure the genetic exchange that is necessary to keep a viable population. It prevents movement of the NEP to private lands. Uh, well, it does prevent, it does not prevent it. And therefore, they can go off at any time and be subject to being killed. And so it's unrealistically optimistic and doesn't appear to be very science-based to consider this population a propagation population once confined to the refuge and kept relatively small. In addition, Fish and Wildlife Service appears to be a functionally abandoning uh, the remnant individuals that might exist on the Coast and Lakes National Wildlife Refuge and not manage them. And they're likely just to go off that refuge and be subject to being killed at will. Fish and Wildlife Service states that conservation partners may help manage populations. And from the record, it, it appears not likely that considering the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission's public statements concerning this species, that they would be a true conservation partner in the recovery of the species. The Fish and Wildlife Service offers uh, in their documentation that they would provide technical assistance. It's highly suspect that considering how they manage the population currently, and when they say they're trying to maximize benefits for the species by providing technical assistance, that in fact, they'd be providing this kind of benefit since there are fewer and fewer of these animals on the land and they'd be confined to federal land and there'd be liberal take without much management beyond just saying you can take them. Also, the captive population isn't sustainable over the very long run according to our read of the best available science. So neither a population in the wild that's reduced and confined or the population that's currently in zoos can sustain this species <coughs> under the current management. Therefore, the Fish and Wildlife Service current management of the species and the proposed Red Wolf 10J rule doom the species to extirpation in the wild and an inexorable decline toward extinction in captivity. Consequently, the Fish and Wildlife Service is not meeting its obligation under law to protect, conserve, and recover the red wolf. And representing the red wolf, the uh, National Wildlife Refuge Association, which is an advocate for refuges, we want to be sure you understand that Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge is left with a public perception that this refuge holds the fate of the red wolf in its hands when the reality is that the refuge management has very little say or control over the red wolf management. Thank you. Katrina Shipley and after her will be Greg Candy. Hello, thank you all. I realize most of you have dedicated your lives to working for and helping save these wolves. I can't imagine that you all would want them to essentially be able to be what we call canned hunted. Um, by local landowners in the areas proposed, what's being called taking the wolves. How often is that happening? Is there a cohesive group of people that we are dealing with? Um, how many of the wolves have been taken by local landowners? You all need us to provide solutions, partnerships, ideas for managing even if that's just kicking the can, making sure that we can ensure more time to figure something out. Um, what are some viable solutions? I mean, it, are we talking about not privatizing the public trusts, but paying these landowners for safe passage for the wolves? Would we perhaps be essentially paying them a ransom? Uh, would it ever be enough? but is that what it's gonna take? It seems like the one thing that is successful about the group of wolves is that they are spreading. That's what they're supposed to do. The coyotes are coming back because it's a diverse biosphere. There's genetic biological diversity. That's a good thing. Do we need to diversify and not just have the zoo captive populations and the one population here, but more 
areas and efforts to ensure that there are areas that are protected instead of shrinking those, putting more emphasis on that because we'll always have landowners and private lands that interfere. But if this is an apex cornerstone species, it would seem that we should be doing more to protect them and not giving people the right to take them on their property as they are an endangered species. What, if any, nomenclature specific turns of phrase, legal jargon, do we need to use that would make them the safest? You all know, you all work with this day in and day out, and some of the great organizations that also work um, with you all. What can we do and what should we propose to ensure that whether we're referring to them as experimental populations versus you know what the differences mean. That kind of sounds like non-essential, that they are allowed to just be taken when they wander out. What would stop people from just taking them because of that? And how much of that is really going on? It seems like there's a lot of discussion about said private landowners. I don't hear a lot of them speaking out. I don't, I don't know where that is all coming from. I'd like to know more about what we're actually talking about, who those landowners are, what their issues are that they are taking up with you all that precipitate making such a huge change to what has been the policies and procedures for so long. So in other words, what can we do to come to a, an agreement with them, but we have to know essentially what their demands are, if any, that's what's not clear to a lot of us. And why so few landowners' needs are being put before a species on the brink of extinction. Thank you. Greg Hamby, and the next one will be Michelle Eichmann. Hello, I am uh, Greg, G-R-E-G, Hamby, H-A-M-B-Y. And um, I've lived in Derrick <coughs> County for 43 years. I, have, I became a carpenter in Derrick County. Uh, it takes a number of years to be a real one, but uh, you learn. And, uh, and I've been in the lodging business for 19 <coughs> years here. So I've built places for people to come here and stay, to have their fun. And we have some wonderful place to be here and come and visit. And now I'm actually hosting those people to stay here. And they're always looking for something to do. And we have here an island of wilderness that is a short, essentially a short drive from the urban suburban morass that exists to the north of us. People want to come down here and they want to get away from concrete and asphalt and freeways. They want to see some wild land. The Outer Banks Visitor Bureau preference, Visitor Preference Survey <coughs> shows that 50% of the visitors come here for national parks. I would say that the National Wildlife Refuge is the same thing. Also, 26% of those visitors surveyed came here for nature and natural areas and bird watching. That is a higher amount than fishing, if you can believe that. They also have come here for hiking at 20%. So there is a great interest to come here to see these wild lands that we have here, which are really, unless you go to the mountains, are the first wild lands that are just down the freeway. And here you are, and you can either just hang out and kill Devil Hills and go play laser tag, or you can go out and, and, um, and see some real nature. And I think that the, the red wolf, uh, intrinsically, it belongs in the landscape. It was created or evolved, however you would like to think about it. It is here. It should stay here. It's been persecuted, just as so many other species have worldwide. And there's just no reason why this small dog is really going to hurt anything. You know, they, it's all part of it. It all worked quite well until, you know, people came across the ocean and started messing around 
with it. You know, it was just fine. And uh, it can be fine again, but it's not going to be quite the same. So I think on a realistic basis, number one, I'm totally in disagreement with any red wolf being killed. If you got one that comes on your property, set a live trap, catch it, and have FWS come get that wolf and take it away. It's, they're protected by the ESA. They should not be killed, period. And uh, so let's, that is how I believe on that. But just as I was speaking to some of the folks here with FWS, you know, people are looking for things to do. Alligator River, as a pra in a practical way, could be a place where it could set up some observation stands. You could pay five bucks, it could help. And people could go and look at wildlife and see it. You need a little something instead of, they would like that. And so why not do that while you're working on what some of the previous speakers have <coughs> talked about, keeping these, getting this population back. And there are many wild places still in this country that you might could find a spot for them. Uh, you can just go on Google Maps and they're pretty easy to see on the satellite photo because they're the places that are still green and they're not divided up in little squares. And they start just south of here, uh, Okefenokee, uh, Apalachicola, Eglin <laughs> Air Force Base, 728,000 acres between Panama City and Fort Walton Beach. So there are places that perhaps these wolves could, could find a home. But I think that since the program has gone along, the money's been put into it, then regardless of what goes on west of the intercoastal waterway, if you can keep something going on the lifeboat that is the Alligator River Refuge and bring some wolves in, let them go, that's a good idea, let a few of them go, let people come, let people see them, and and this would be a way to have some raised in the wild and, and hopefully still occupy this planet while people who are <coughs> smarter than me figure out a way to get this, get them back and, and to show that they, they really do no harm, I don't think. And uh, thank you very much. Michelle Eidlin, and after her will be Tim Eidlin. My name is Michelle Eidlin, M-I-C-H-E-L-E-A-Y-D-L-E-T-T. -E -E I'm president of Outlaw Conservation and Wildlife Chapter. For 30 years, the Red Wolf thrived in North Carolina. Through the work of the FWS and cooperation of private landowners, it was a model of success. That partnership needs to be rebuilt rather than thrown out. Red Wolves belong in North Carolina and the service should commit to its support of the red wolf recovery, not just red wolf propagation in the state. The current red wolf recovery area is home to the only successful red wolf reintroduction and the only wild population in the world. The service must not walk away from that, especially not until another population has been established. The service should recommit to active management of the red wolf population, including work working coyote sterilization, pup fostering, and working with landowners throughout the existing Red Wolf Recovery Area, not just the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge. It's very curious why the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge was not included in the dramatically scaled back recovery area, as that is over 110,000 acres of federally managed land. That is further evidence of the service abandoning the program. Admittedly, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, there have been problems caused by the service and failure in community and landowner relations. But does that failure mean abandon the ship? Better to solve the problem here in North Carolina, where there are wild woods on the landscape, than to assume the service can just do better in the future in some other recovery area. The NC State Masco is the Red Wolf. Go pack. And the team colors are red. It's a travesty to see wolves left behind due to the FWS failure and unwillingness to correct the problems and the hurdles. It seems the landowners need help addressing the coyote program instead of killing wolves. I'm definitely against that. Why not willingness to work with 
with willing landowners and consider incentives such as coyote management support, wildlife easement support, and other things such as this. Please do the right thing and actively support red wolf recovery that is essential to this threatened species that obviously is an endangered species in North Carolina. Thank you. Tim Idlett, and the next speaker after him will be Victoria Hagemeister. Uh, Tim, T-I-M, Idlett, A-Y-D-L-E-T-T. -T. And my comments are not addressed to our local superintendents and people who run the refuges. Uh, seems like there has been a total abandonment of good, sound, common sense science at the top. I'd like to quote the mission. The mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with others to conserve property, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for the continued benefit of the American people. Um, I'm a retired educator, uh, professional biologist, and habitat is what I'd like to speak to. Um, I served once on the State Park Trust Fund Authority, and we once had a director who knew how to talk to people, landowners, and never did we ever have to use eminent domain to, to add acreage to our state properties. We have over 200,000 acres in our state parks now. Another concern that's probably more difficult than the red wolf concern is the 238 bird species that Audubon has declared that are susceptible to climate change. And what we're gonna do about that is a very, very tough venture ahead. But habitat is an issue that can be solved by increasing the habitat available. Uh, we've seen what happened to quail in North Carolina, and that still continues to be a problem. The, this is the only successful red wolf reintrodu reintroduction program in the world. Um, Federal Wildlife Service should recommit to active management of the red wolf population. And if you need space, uh, Pocosin Lakes, which is nearby, there's over 110,000 acres there. And one of my uh, wishes is that one of these days, the Land and Water Conservation Fund will be completely refunded once again, because North Carolina really benefited from grants received through the LWCF to purchase parklands and uh, make space available for the public. So if we need space, we need to write our congressman, let's get the Land and Water Conservation Fund funded back up. Because habitat is a key issue for the red wolf. And I am definitely opposed to a red wolf wandering off the property and being killed. Uh, they can be trapped and returned either back to captivity or back on the refuge. The refuge, the FWS needs to work with landowners to correct any of these impediments that would infringe on a successful reintroduction program. It's time, as a principle, you have to look back at your mission occasionally to see what your, uh, what steps you needed to take to reach the goals of your mission. And I think the Wildlife Service needs to memorize that mission statement, particularly those at the upper, upper echelon of the Federal Wildlife Service. Uh, we need to save our North Carolina red wolves, and um, I know we had an issue up at Dismal Swamp. One of the farmers said, uh, what are you going to do about your bears that come and eat my corn? And I said, well, Monday morning I'll have a I'll sit down meeting with these bears and we'll tell them to get, stay back on the refuge. And that's why when we purchased land for the Dismal Swamp State Park, we wanted to make sure we had at least 15,000 acres or better to add to the 112,000 acres of the Mount Mesquite, I mean the uh, 
Dismal Swamp National Wildlife Refuge because you've got to have plenty of land for bears, you've got to have the same amount of land for wolves. So, uh, and of course, most of the land outside of these designated areas is private. So, we need the right people talking to our landowners to make this work. Thank you. Victoria Hagemeister, and after her will be Riley Smith. Okay, my name is Victoria Hagemeister. That's spelled B I C T O R I A. H A G E M E I S T E R. Um, the other speakers have already said many of the things I was going to say tonight, but one concern I have um, is with the North Carolina Wildlife Commission. I think that they do a very poor job of supporting wildlife that is not of interest to hunters. And I would like to encourage everyone in this room who lives in the state of North Carolina to put pressure on them to work with fish and wildlife to save the wolves. I do not agree with the part of the rule that says home landowners should be allowed to kill wolves at will. There's already too much of that occurring and that's the principal reason that the population is plummeted. Landowners need to understand that we are trying to save a species from extinction and that is far more important than any uh, concerns they may have. There are things, proven things that homeowners can do, landowners can do to protect livestock, and we need to be encouraging people to coexist with wildlife. Um, we also need to put pressure on the North Carolina State Legislature to adequately fund wildlife support in this state. Part of the reason that the Wildlife Commission is so concerned with hunters is that it, the sale of hunting licenses is their principal source of revenue. The state legislature needs to recognize that wildlife serves a useful purpose and helps keep this planet habitable by holding the web of life together. They need to be educated and it's up to those of us who care about the animals in this state and on this planet to help them understand the need to adequately support our wildlife. Thank you. Riley Smith, and our kid will be Robert Lapella. Uh, R I L. Can we wait the timer after I tell her my name so I can get a full five minutes? Thank you. Um, R I L E Y Smith, S M I T H. Okay. Um, I want to tell you guys a story. Um, a couple of days ago, I went to KDH, the Wendy's. So I went there, and it was really packed. Like, there was a lot of people, as in there's going to be a lot of wolves in a very small area. Very small area. So it was very packed. I'm like, well, crap. I'm out here on work lunch. I'm trying to get some food real quick. I'm just going to go to Burger King, you know, right beside it. And then, boom, I get shot. That's the same thing, man. You put in all these animals in a small area where you actually can't even put any more animals in it right now, and then you're expecting them to not venture out and get food, and then you're gonna shoot them. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, let's see, I got a couple other things. One second. Um, oh, also, this is more for the uh, audience. So they do a real poor job of this, but there was actually four options of taking care of the red wolves. Um, this is option number three. Option number two was to actually bring in more wolves, um, bring in more animals, and help the environment overall. Um, and I am very upset that this is not being shown and is not a counter um, theory into how we can uh, deal with the wolves. What else? Um, wolves keep coyote numbers low. Um, I mean, sometimes they mate, but overall they keep them low. More wolves pack, mean less wolves. So, I mean, I mean less coyotes. So, if you're a landowner and you got wolves on your land, then you might not have so many coyotes. Not just that, but with option number two, it would actually allow them to sterilize the coyotes and prevent them from breeding. So that would protect your land. <coughs> um, let's see here. 
Option number two would also allow us to uh, bring in more wolves puppies. Because the problem is right now with the study that they did was that um, diversity needs more genetics in the wolves. It needs more biodiversity. Um, and so right now they can't bring any more puppies in. So with option number two, they could, and they could help it flourish. What else? Um, oh, here's a statistic I read in a book a couple of years ago for a college paper. More people die every year from a toothpaste than wolves. Toothpicks than wolves. In the last 30 years, there have been seven livestock death incidents because of wolves. In the last 30 years, that's seven. And you're going to kill 15 wolves because seven sheep died in the last 30 years? That doesn't make much sense to me. Let's see here, what else? Oh, um, I don't know if you guys saw that picture that they put up of uh, the zoning. So I was talking to uh, Mr. Madison, and he says there's 34-ish wolves in the whole general area that there is now. Um, in the designated area, it want to make that 14. So that's less than half. You are leaving less than half of a, you are leaving more than half of a population to get slaughtered. Not to get turned in, not to get caught, but to get slaughtered. To me, that's unacceptable as a human. We can do better than leave over half of a population left to be taken because that's the political correct term instead of killing wolves. Endangered species. Um, one final thing. I watched a movie a few years ago, uh, Spider Man. Maybe you guys saw it. I'm not sure. Um, but the uncle tells Peter Parker, he says, with great power comes great responsibility. As a species, we've been to the moon. As a species, we're planning to go to Mars. As a species, we've had two world wars. With great power comes great responsibility. We have claimed dominant species on this world, and we have the responsibility to protect all the other species because we know that they need help. We know there's less than 40 species here, and you guys don't want to help them. With great power, comes great responsibility. We know better. We know that they're hurt. We know that they need help to thrive, that for the whole ecosystem to thrive. As a woman said, that it's a cornerstone. This is a cornerstone species. If you don't know what happened in Yellowstone, um, they, they reintroduced the wolves, and uh, it basically changed the way rivers even flowed. Um, so again, with great power comes great responsibility. We have the power to have a microphone here. We have the responsibility to help the wolves, protect them, protect our environment. And I'm done. Robert Capella. And after that will be Rob Keeler. Hi, my name is Rob Lapella, R-O-B-L-U-P as in Paul, E-L-L-A. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of new to the Red Wolf uh, issue here. Um, I've been, <coughs> my friend of mine is involved with it, I'm, um, but I've been reading and studying and got interested in it, and I'm kind of an overall kind of a, you know, believe in the survival of all species, and, you know, we all, could, we all should be able to live together on this planet without killing each other off, uh, especially not, you know, species that really need our protection. And so a couple of things I've noticed is that, I mean, you know, when you showed your, you know, the chart, is the chart shows a precipitous decline in the wolf population, you know, in the in, in the recent in, in recent history, and you know, so part of the question I would have is that has anybody looked at that and said, gee, why is it declining like that? Is it because more red wolves are getting shot and killed, not taken, they're getting killed? Um, is that the reason by by, by landowners that, that they're having so how does shrinking their land? How, how does reducing the rate that the, the land they have to roam and, and giving landowners even more license to kill, how is that helping the, 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 them or how is that ameliorating that problem? Are you going to tell the wolves, you know, don't cross this red line? I don't, I, I don't know that a wolf can, will do that. I think they're going to range, you know, in their, you know to, to, where they, to where they can find food. And where they can where they can mate, where they can be like wolves. 
you know, it's a, as somebody else said, it's actually it's a large dog. Um, I know my dogs will range as far as they can go given out, given no fence. So are you, you know, short of fencing their smaller area and letting, you know, I, I, I don't see how a smaller area makes it a more viable species and a more viable area for them uh, in which to live. Um, you know, also you're, you're gonna, you're, you're also, talk, they're also talking about releasing more captive wolves into the wild wolf population. And if people are just being allowed to shoot them and kill them at an increased rate, that's gonna deplete both the, the wild wolf uh, population and the captive wolf population. So then we won't have as, have as many wild wolves, nor will we have as many captive breeding wolves. And you know, roughly 300 wolves in, in both populations doesn't seem to me to be a very sustainable population. It's just there's very small, and as somebody else pointed out, there seems to be a lot, instead of shrinking the area, there seems to be a lot of other areas, the coast of National Forest, places south of here, where they might keep going, where there's deer, where there's food, where there's land, for them to go and work with the landowners. You know, work with the people, work with them, to, you know, live trapping, um, you know, penalties for killing them. They're, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, you can't, it's hard to mistake a wolf. You're supposed to know what you're shooting at if you're a hunter. You know, if you don't, if you don't recognize what you're shooting at, maybe you shouldn't have shot at it. Oh, I thought it was a, was a coyote. I thought it was a raccoon. No, it's a wolf. You know, so I, I so I, I mean, I, I think the, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the, you know, I think we all have a, have a responsibility to the public and responsibility to nature to conserve and to, and, and, and to provide you know, you know, rules and regulations and guidance and, 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 a, and a better solution than just what, you know, what looks to me to be just, just, a, just a quicker, quicker death for the red wolf. Thank you. Rob Keeler, and after that will be Ross Riley. It's Rob Keeler, it's K-E-E-H-N-E-R. Hello, um, I'm Rob, and um, I've been in North Carolina a very long time. And when I first moved to North Carolina, we were the 38th most populous state. Currently, we're the seventh. There have been a massive influx of people here, and the amount of land use has gone up drastically. In the triangle where I live, there are no trees anymore. The people come in, they cut them down, and we are losing every last bit of nature we have. I walked 100 miles myself through did sections two and three of the Mountains of Sea Trail this spring. Never once did I leave earshot of an engine. There is no wilderness left. It's up to all of us to save what we have left and just be temperate. I've been all over the country and I've experienced coyotes everywhere. I seek them out. They're one of my favorite animals. And so I've seen a coyote eat berries in a field till it puked. I've enjoyed a sunset at Inks Lake State Park and I could see one in binoculars sitting on a boulder watching the sunset with me. Last spring I went out and I watched the, or last fall I went out to Oregon and I watched the the solar eclipse. There are a small group of campers around a uh, small mountain lake, and when the sudden onrush of darkness came, we all saw the corona, all the people hooting and hollered around this lake. They were all so excited. But so did the coyotes in the forest around us. They're amazing animals. They're extremely intelligent, and they're extremely smart, and they're extremely adept at surviving. I I've read a report somewhere, I don't know if it's true yet, but they've even crossed the Panama Canal. And this comes down to really what the problem is with our wildlife management, it's fragmented. And then we have terrible organizations like the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission who have an extermination policy on these animals. 46,600 coyotes were reported killed last year. That's over a third of what was reported for, for the deer kill. So we have an extermination policy in this state and you're expecting wolves to be safe if they even venture off a few miles from refuge? This refuge is tiny. I kayaked across it in a day. I don't know where you expect these animals to go. I expect you to, to return them to everywhere. That map with all the yellow on it, that's where I want all these predators. We need them. We need them to keep the deer healthy. We need to keep them to eat rabbit raccoons, animals that have issues. They clean our forests for us. They keep everything strong. So I don't understand why the second recovery area was never sought out and why it wasn't why you didn't reintroduce them into the second area. I don't understand why you can't understand that it might, be, it might take 20, 30, 40, 50 years for an animal, a population of animals to get life skills. 
you know, if you put wolves into the Nantahala, they may not survive for a few years. It may be tough for them. They might not figure out, oh, I can eat marmots. I can eat, you know, chipmunks or whatever else they can find. It might, might, might not be just deer. And the parallel to this might be some, an animal much like the uh, giant Pacific sea otter. They found an island population of these many years ago. And there were only like 30 or 40. And there's still only two or three or 4,000 of them in California. They've never been able to spread because it takes them that long to learn what you can eat, where you can go, what I should avoid. And I don't think any animal in this day and age can avoid humans. It's just not possible. There's too many of us. And if you're going to propose rules that allow humans to kill them, and especially with our shitty-ass North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission with their ties that are too tight and can't think, people are going to exterminate these animals. That's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> Ross Riley. And then that will be Stephen K-M-I-E-C. Ross Riley, R-O-S-S-R-I-L-E-Y. Uh, we don't... <laughs> I'm here to drive, drive a, a stake right in the heart of this program. I, I want to see it ended, so I don't, I don't believe I'm... I'm uh, I'll be repeating anything anybody else has said. Um, I'm here, my granddaughter, beautiful granddaughter is over here. I've lived here 54 years. I've lived in Man's Harbor. I'm, I'm speaking for the folks that are overlooked, the folks on the mainland that put up with um, FWS regulations uh, or the great, well, whatever. Uh, let's see, and I didn't write this as a speech it's, it's disjointed, but I'll, I'll read it as one. I didn't know that's what way it would be handled. Uh, there, let's uh, say, uh, my granddaughter entered into the belly of the beast, but our opinion counts as we represent the thinking of the uh, affected folks on the mainland. Why is there no community outreach to the people affected by these, these rules? I would never have known about this meeting if I hadn't called Joe Madison to express how I feel about the, this proposal. I'm greatly heartened by how Folks now see how this has played out. Newspaper comments from all over the country have turned. Used to be uh, folks know the facts, sided with uh, FWS um, in the past. Now when I read um, newspaper comments from all over the country, the comments are predominantly said, hey, these things are coyotes. That's all they are. They're three-quarter coyote. They're a quarter wolf. That's the DNA. There's no question about it. You can, uh, the Fish and Wildlife says that it's uh, that that's good enough. That's still a wolf. I say it's not a wolf. It's a coyote. Um, why do I want the program to stop? The impact on wildlife. I've lived in Vance Harbor for since 1980. We used to have uh, what do you call it? Coveys of quail in the yard. There used to be rabbits. Um, turkeys are we're making a comeback, but now they're they're stuck over in the west end of the refuge. They don't they don't seem to be expand be able to expand. The turkeys live up in the trees, but ground nesting birds take a take a beating with uh, wild canines. Uh, we let you try your experiment in our world, our neighborhood. We had an open mind. It didn't turn out as you said it would. You've had plenty of time. Now we want to stop. Your time is up. The county commissioners want the animals gone. The local main, mainland residents want the animals gone. The state legislature wants the animals gone. One of our U.S. senators put a rider in the last budget, but it got killed with the right, you know, I don't know, continuing resolution to stop the funding. And North Carolina Wildlife wants the program stopped. I've talked to, to um, Gordon Myers and the, some of the biologists. Uh, apex predators. We need a break. Apex predators. They have a place in the world, but they're not managed. We have bears, wolves, coyotes, and alligators. Um, the, your, your record with the bears is abysmal. The, the locals don't care anymore about your goals. They're tired, tired of picking up trash. They're, there's just too many bears. There's no cull on the bears. The bears are, now people are taking things into their own hands. The, ban, the bears are taking rides to the landfill. Uh, they're going in dumpsters, they're going in trash cans, but it's, it's being taken care of. Um, bears are probably the worst on the newborn fawns. That's, that's the big problem. Big problem is the deer population. As they can smell the best, and when the, the fawn's about to move then, or to be dropped, then the, um, then the bears are on it. The canines take over after the fawn starts moving around. Um, 
I talked to Joe a couple days ago, and he, he, he complained, said something about the liberal deer hunting laws in North Carolina. We, well, we don't shoot spotted fawns. We shoot what the NC Wildlife Regulations say we can shoot, and they've been moving to try to get the, the doe-buck ratio closer, so they've cut down on the number of does you can shoot. So they're, they're headed in the right direction. Uh, coyotes. Coyotes are killing pets cats, little dogs, even big dogs. People are finding Rottweilers, Huskies, Golden Retrievers, Labs eaten by coyotes over on the beach. What's to keep the coyotes from preying on the red wolves? The coyotes greatly outnumber the wolves. Deer population designated as poor. That is, our, that is the classification of the deer population in Deer County because they're, um, because of the environment. Uh, what are we doing bringing wolves in when we have unlimited bears? It, it, it makes no sense. How did the coyotes get here? The government blames uh, uh, fox hunters. Most everybody I talk to blames the government. I don't believe U.S. Fish and Wildlife brought coyotes in here. But I, uh, military bases have brought them onto bases to, uh, to hold down the uh, deer population. So, and we're surrounded by military uh, bases, so that's, that <coughs> helped probably accelerate bringing them here. Um, uh, I'm about out of time, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Stephen K. M. I. D. C. Kamek. Thank you. Kim yeah. Wheeler is that. Okay. That's a S T E P H E N K M I E C. All right. So I uh, I wanted to come here tonight with an open mind. As someone who really is coming from a pretty pro-wolf background, I was kind of alarmed with a lot of what I saw reading the recent Fish and Wildlife proposals. Um, and I wanted to better understand the rationale for, for what was being put out there. And I actually really appreciate you guys kind of helping me with that and talking me through kind of some of the thought behind it. Um, I'll skip the commentary on the importance of wolves and apex predators in the ecosystem and even the small red wolf population and the importance of that, because I think you guys understand that. You can look on Fish and Wildlife's own website and see some great uh, articles about that, that subject. Um, but obviously there, there are some problems with the program that stands right now. Um, seems like the current management strategy uh, has sort of hit a wall. Um, there's been a decline in the red wolf population in the last several years. Um, and it seems like something needs to change. Um, now, as was mentioned elsewhere, there, there is a really pretty solid proposal on the table, the sort of uh, alternative to, uh, to bring back some of the proven strategies that we know work with wolf recovery. Uh, I mean, a lot of people still seem very surprised to learn that the Red Wolf program predates a lot of even the Gray Wolf recovery that we see out west that's been so successful and in the news and, and so notable that a lot of the strategies that they used so successfully were copied from things developed by the Red Wolf program. Uh, so things that we use in the past, like pup fostering, coyote sterilization, things like that, that really seem to be working, that unfortunately we, we've moved away from. Uh, a step back towards that could really get this population back on track. It could get us back to a sustainable place and really seems like the, the right alternative. And I obviously really want to voice my support for that. Um, a lot of attention is being paid to the kind of so-called alternative three, the reduction in the protected area, and the removal of any prohibitions on, on taking of wolves outside of that area. Um, I feel like after today I better understand the rationale for that plan, but I still don't feel like I can support it. Um, the risk is too great. It, it's hard to imagine a scenario where this doesn't lead to the extinction of red wolves in the wild. Uh, the proposed area is clearly not large enough to sustain a population. We're talking about an area that could maybe hold two packs and you're talking about a situation where at some point wolves have to venture outside of that even just for breeding purposes and as soon as they leave that land they're subject to take. Um, it, it would just be far too easy for such a small population to, to decline to completely unmanageable numbers in, in a very short time frame. Um, I understand the need for, for landowner outreach, absolutely. Um, you know, people, people live in this area, they're living alongside these wolves, and, and that needs to be taken into account. Um, I think that a lot can be done through greater education. Um, 
A lot could be done through compensation for lost livestock. Um, there are proven methods for you know, protecting livestock in, without having to kill wolves in areas with much larger wolf populations and much larger wolves uh, that, again, have been successful elsewhere. Um, I know coyotes have been a major focus, again, understandably. Um, again, and I hope through, through better education and increased awareness, you know, we could, we could get people to understand even the effects of wolves on coyote populations and the positive role they have actually in displacing coyotes. Um, and also the general ineffectiveness of trying to limit coyote populations just by shooting them. Uh, it's, it's an unmanageable strategy. It simply just doesn't work. Um, I'm reminded of the significant uptick in red wolf gunshot mortality during the brief period when nighttime coyote hunts were permitted. And it seems pretty much inevitable that the trend would continue in that direction if protections on the red wolves were removed in this area. The fact is, this is an incredibly vulnerable, vulnerable population. 35 wolves could easily be wiped out in a very short time by very few people. Um, it seems impossible to justify the, the rules proposed. Even if support for wolves is widespread, it would be, uh, there would be virtually nothing, prote nothing protecting the wolves that are in place from even a small determined opposition. As a citizen of North Carolina, I'm very proud of my state's history in leading the way in predator conservation through the red wolf recovery, and I would just hate to see us abandon that position. Thank you. Kim Wheeler, and after her will be Michelle My Myers. Thank you. K-I-M-W-H-E-E-L-E-R, and I represent the Red Wolf Coalition, Coalition located in Tyrrell County in Columbia, North Carolina. When the first eight Red Wolves took their first steps in North Carolina, it was a result of years of hard work and dedication to the Red Wolf. A recovery plan was implemented and the task of restoring the red wolf to part of its historic range began. It began with a lot of dedicated people, determination, and the knowledge that the red wolf has value. On page four of the draft EA, you note that the original recovery site, Alligator River, National Wildlife Refuge, and the Dare County bombing range were too small to support more than 30 red wolves, and that they left these federal properties for private lands. The current wild population is about 35 known wolves, with about 25 of them currently residing on those two federal properties. If you know that these federal lands cannot support many, wolf, many more than 25 wolves, why are you setting up the proposed rule to fail the wolves? At what point did the U.S. Fish and Wildlife stop valuing the red wolf? On page 14 of the EA, you cite information regarding the ecological and social issues regarding canid management that suggest the, that outreach, education, and financial incentives would be ineffective because they do not hit to the heart of historical recovery efforts. The proposed rules suggest that working with private landowners to achieve acceptance of the Red Wolf will fall to the interested NGOs. How are interested NGOs supposed to foster, foster landowner cooperation when the Fish and Wildlife has stated they don't think outreach, education, and financial incentives will help achieve acceptance of the red wolf on the landscape? Again, I ask, when did the U.S. Fish and Wildlife stop valuing the red wolf? In the proposed rule, rules that wolves that leave the two federal properties run the risk of being killed. Family units will be disrupted. Important breeders and potential breeders will be lost forever. The ability for these animals to become part of a successful propagation population will be limited. Knowing that pack dynamics will be severely impacted by the loss of animals, why are you setting up a rule that will restrict the success of a propagation population? Again, I ask, when did the fish and wildlife stop valuing the red wolf? We are not in favor of the proposed rule for a whole host of reasons, most of which you will hear or have heard tonight. For us, it comes down to how we view the life of every red wolf and the importance it has in relation to its continued existence in the wild. 
We urge the Fish and Wildlife to not move forward with Alternative 3, but to support Alternative 2, which shows the American public that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service still values, still sees the value of a healthy, productive red wolf population in North Carolina. Thank you. Michelle Meyer, and after her will be Sarah Alford. Hello, my name is Michelle Myers. That's M I C H E L L E M Y E R S. Um, I'm with the Center for Biological Diversity. I have a master's degree in environmental management from Duke University, but I'm here as a concerned citizen and a resident of North Carolina. The, the proposal to reduce the range of this critically imperiled red world species from five counties to alligator refuge and a bombing range is a sentence for extinction. The DNA stock in the captive population is, has been reducing in quality. And the population in the wild is critical for a diverse, um, diverse population. For the last 30 years, the service has been working uh, in good faith to foster this population, which is now established here, to retreat from this uh, into a significantly reduced area would be to lay to waste the good work that has already been done. And the population, which once topped 150, would sharply decline as wolves will be killed as soon as they leave the refuge. I understand that coyote management is a concern to local property owners. I offer that, like many that spoke before me, that option two, rather than the preferred alternative which has been presented by the Fish and Wildlife Service, is a more biologically sound solution. Maintaining the five county range um, while allowing for coyote sterilization and the fostering of new pups would better discourage the rampant coyote populations than shooting alone. I would also advocate that Fish and Wildlife Service be given additional support to manage the, five, the current five county area, work more with private landowners, and create safe corridors for these animals who naturally roam and will not stay within the small refuge area that has been proposed. Um, I believe that there is a way to create a public campaign that would help limit coyote populations and also limit wolf mortality. Um, I believe uh, that is premature to reduce the territory of the wolves in the wild before potential new places for reintroduction have been identified, um, as I believe is this the plan of Fish and Wildlife Service uh, going forward as they adopt a new management strategy. I'd also like to comment though what I've observed here today is that a majority, with the exception of one, of the residents who came here to speak, many of whom live close or certainly in North Carolina, have been here to advocate for additional support to have the Red Wolf thrive in this area. I think that the Red Wolf is part of a public doctrine that in 1967, we made a commitment to maintain and help thrive so that future generations will say that they live in a world where we have apex predators, we have wild wolves, we have natural landscapes as they looked before, we were able to control our development and use of these lands. Reducing the recovery area to the small refuge um, would abandon that commitment entirely, and it would say that we have failed and the last 30 years have not worked. I don't believe we've failed. I believe that we need to set sights on these priorities and protect the species and turn it over to the next generation. Sarah Alford, and after her will be Sarah Watts. Uh, my name is Sarah Alford, that's S-A-R-A-H-A-L, F as in Frank, O-R-D. Um, I'm a resident from Prairie Talk, and I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Um, before I start this, one thing that I can tell you is with the landowners, in my job I see a lot of people all over Prairie Talk, and if you come to people in this area and you talk down to them, if you're rude to them, if you try to force them and tell them what to do on their land, even if you're the federal government, even if you're the local government, and you have the right to be there, if you impose on them without being polite and understanding and listening, they will write you off. And somewhere in all of this, I feel like part of what's happened with the land <coughs> is there's a pissing contest, for lack of a better word. Somebody's made somebody mad. They didn't treat them and the way they thought they should be treated. Um, and I'm going to go into hunters here real quick, but um, I don't think these landowners necessarily are unreasonable. Maybe it's just who's talking to them or the way they're being talked to. Sorry. Um, 
Before I express my opinion, I would like to say that the hunters I know are smart, educated, and willing to follow laws regardless of their personal feelings. The hunters I know eat the meat from their kills or give it to those in need. They are not wasteful, vengeful, vengeful or haphazard. I have respect for hunters and I have never had a personal experience with a hunter that has left me disliking the individual. Uh, much of the current requested changes do not make sense to me though. The first thing that does not make sense to me is the assumption that red wolves will be better protected if their official protection area is reduced to the federal land. Red wolves are already killed, killed on federal land. I didn't see any mention of illegal kills of red wolves on federal land in the government's proposal. I would think if the red wolves, if the red wolves protected area is to be reduced by 90% for their own protection, there would be an increased focus on the remaining 10%. The next thing that does not make sense to me is the argument landowners cannot control the coyote population. Um, population control measures such as spaying and neutering um, coyotes is being undone by killing those coyotes. I'm sorry. And um, this could be improved by stronger visual aids for hunters and co-education endeavors with hunters and U.S. Fish and Wildlife so that they can identify them. Um, Coyotes can be killed by landowners, just not at night, and there are certain regulations, but they can kill them. Um, night hunting of coyotes was not even in existence prior to 2012, so while they can't do it now, uh, they couldn't do it before 2012 anyway. Um, the landowners do seem to be fairly successful at shooting coyotes or red wolves, they think are coyotes, during the day. Um, I did not see data that suggested landowners were unsuccessful at their attempts in killing coyotes or red wolves. They thought were coyotes within the current laws and guidelines. Um, it doesn't make sense to me that a wildlife population <coughs> could suffer so many seemingly illegal gunshot mortalities that a new argument would be taken up and championed by the Federal Fish and Wildlife. Um, one that says protection is failing so severely that it's only right to let the rest of the population legally be exposed to gunshot mortalities. Um, my overall problem with all of this is the, is the absurdity of it. You have a group of people who say they aren't happy, and you say you're obligated to change the law to make them happy, and then you're going to go out and write other landowners and other taxpayers tickets because they didn't follow your rules and regulations. Um, I just want to close with, on the way here, my daughter said in the car show, I had one question. She's 12 years old. And without her permission, um, I'm going to close with her question. What is so horribly wrong with the human race that we would kill the last of a species just to kill another that's more abundant? Thank you. Sarah Watts, and after that will be Mitch Peel. Hello, my name is Sarah Watts. That's S-A-R-A-H-W-A-T-T-S. Uh, I am the Educational Programs Coordinator for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, based at Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. <coughs> Excuse me. I have been located at the Red Wolf Education and Health Center at Pocosin, since, at Pocosin Lakes since June of this year, where we have two live red wolves for the public to learn about and observe. My goals at the Red Wolf Center are to raise awareness and educate the public about red wolves their unique characteristics, and the roles this apex species plays in the ecosystem. I will be leading programs this summer, such as Red Wolf 101, How to Talk Like a Wolf, and Red Wolves What's for Dinner. These programs will give me the opportunity to speak to the public about red wolf behavior and biology while introducing them to our two resident red wolves, Lukash and Sequoia. My, roles at the, my role at the Red Wolf Center was made possible because of considerable public support for Red Wolf education and natural resources programming in this area. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Mitch Peel, and after that will be Sierra Weaver. Good evening, my name is Mitch Peel, M-I-T-C-H-P-E-E-L-E. -E -E. And I'm Senior Director of Public Policy with the North Carolina Farm Bureau. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments tonight on the proposed replacement of regulations 
for the non-essential experimental population of red wolves in Northeast North Carolina. The North Carolina Farm Bureau is a general farm organization which represents the interest of farmers and rural families, landowners all across North Carolina. Therefore, issues that affect private property rights are of most concern to us. North Carolina Farm Bureau opposed the Red Wolf Program over 30 years ago when it was first introduced in northeastern North Carolina and said then it would not work. 30 years later and $30 million later, our prediction held true. Our greatest concern then and now is how this program could impact the ability of farmers and other landowners to manage their own property. In the executive summary for the proposed revision, to the Northeast North Carolina 90 Central Experimental Population for Red Wolves, it states that success of the Red Wolf Recovery Program under the existing regulations has been limited. However, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has recognized the problems of this program in recent years, and in 2016, they assembled the Red Wolf Recovery Team, a team of experts representing government agricultural interests, academia, conservation interests, and private landowners to examine the program and make recommendations going forward. In their report, the team said that there needs to be a fundamental change in the direction for the red wolf conservation. This could include retooling the program or termination. The proposed revision in the NEC um, North uh, non-essential experimental population for red wolves would scale the managed area to fewer counties but recognizes that wolves will still probably travel beyond the regulated areas onto private lands. In other words, we will still have the problems that we have today. The proposal would, however, allow private landowners to kill wolves that enter their property, but then that sets up farmers and landowners as the bad guys who are killing an endangered species, and even possibly potential for lawsuits uh, that will surely come against landowners and the service uh, in the future. No one, for the most part, wants to kill these animals. They just don't want them on their property. In addition, we will still have problems with other things such as interbreeding with coyotes and other problems we've heard tonight. In the very name of the program itself, it mentions that these are non-essential experimental populations. That means this population is not essential to, to the continued existence of the species. And speaking of species, an additional consideration is that many experts have studied the red wolf for years and believe that it is not a distinct species at all, but rather a hybrid of the gray wolf and coyote. That raises the question as to whether it should be considered a species at all and granted protection under the Endangered Species Act. This issue continues to be debated in scientific circles today. The same problems existed with this program was attempted in the Great Smoky Mountains back in 1991, but the service ultimately did the right thing and terminated it in 1998. Today, the service needs to do the right thing again and terminate the Northeast North Carolina non-essential experimental population for Red Wolf's program. We have many additional and detailed comments regarding this proposal and we'll include those in our written comments that will be submitted later this month. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to share these comments this evening. Sierra Weaver, and after that will be Ramona McGee. My name is Sierra Weaver, S-I-E-R-R-A, W-E-A-V-E-R. -E and I'm submitting comments uh, this evening on behalf of the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, most of you all know that when we appear in front of you submitting comments on behalf of SCLC, we are most often speaking on behalf of other clients as well. Um, we will be submitting written comments on, on behalf of a number of groups we have worked with over the years, but I would like to clarify that tonight I am focusing on the Southern Environmental Law Center's interest in the Red Wolf um, and in the very special place um, that is Eastern North Carolina. Um, for about the entire 30 year history of the Southern Environmental Law Center, we have worked in Eastern North Carolina. 
Again, many of the folks in this room know Derb Carter. A lot of that work, especially 30 years ago, was being undertaken by Derb. Um, he would be here tonight if he could be. Um, I'm going to do my best to carry the torch for him. Um, we have been working on protecting Eastern North Carolina's air, water, land, and wildlife throughout this history. This has included a wide range of projects, um, from protecting the lands that eventually became Alligator River and Pecosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuges, to reintroducing the red wolves, and uh, also notably in this group, um, successfully challenging the Navy's plans to take 100 local farms to build its outlying landing field. Um, these and many more issues are all issues SCLC has been involved in over the years. Um, and the Red Wolf has been at the heart of so much of that in Eastern North Carolina. Notably, our history with the Red Wolf Recovery Program um, has largely been one in which we are on the same side as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have defended the Red Wolf and we have defended the Endangered Species Act from those who would have undercut the Red Wolf Recovery effort in North Carolina from the very beginning. This was litigation back in the 1990s in which a handful of landowners and the state of North Carolina attacked the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Regulations. Our organizations, community organizations, wildlife organizations, and the Fish and Wildlife Service defended those regulations um, and created an important precedent upholding the Endangered Species Act and upholding the regulations that governed the Red Wolf Program for 30 years from that challenge. Indeed, when I first came to work on Red Wolves back in 2013, one of the first documents I was given was a 2012 letter from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to the state of North Carolina asking them to rescind and abandon their night hunting rules for coyotes. This was the first time that North Carolina was going to allow the night hunting of coyotes, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, we understand you have a problem. We want to work with you about that problem. But this problem you have and the way you have proposed to fix it is going to impede and undercut recovery in the run from the wild. And that is not okay. Recovery must be our guiding principle. That is the Fish and Wildlife Service we know. That is the Fish and Wildlife Service we have been eager to work with to save this population over the years. Importantly, in that letter, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, the program we've undertaken, this active management of red wolves, sterilization of coyotes, has been more effective than shooting coyotes that you now propose. Opposition to the red wolf is not new. Uh, difficult work on the ground to reconcile competing interests uh, and deal with this opposition is not new. What is new and what we are all dealing with here today is the agency's decision so, to so dramatically reverse course and abandon the statutory mandate given to it by Congress to recover the endangered red wolf in the wild. The Fish and Wildlife Service must recommit to the recovery of the red wolf in the wild. Recovery in zoos does not exist. That is what the Fish and Wildlife Service proposes here and it is what must be rejected. In addition, a federal judge has already said that Congress's mandated protection of the red wolf was not just a half-hearted attempt to see what happens after a few wolves have been reintroduced in the wild, yet that is essentially what Fish and Wildlife Service's proposed rule represents. Red wolves have been on the ground in eastern North Carolina for 30 years, and for nearly all of this history, that has been a resounding success. That happened through a lot of hard work from a lot of really dedicated people at the service. Um, we believe that effort was successful, and we believe that success can happen again. Indeed, the outlying landing field case I mentioned earlier was a case not so long ago when this entire community, this entire peninsula, rallied around each other and rallied around the Red Wolf for what it could do to protect this region. Thank you very much. We'll be submitting written comments as well. Ramona McGee, and after that will be Ben Prater. My name is spelled R-A-M-O-N-A, M-C, capital G-E-E. -E. Um, many of you may know me as one of the attorneys working on Red Wolves with the Southern Environmental Law Center, but tonight I'm here to offer my comments um, in my personal capacity. I first learned about the Red Wolf in 2012 while I was in law school. 
Um, that's the single day of my environmental law class that I remember best. And my apologies go to Professor Flat, wherever he is, that that's what sticks with me. But I was so inspired sitting in class that day to learn about this Endangered Species Act success story that was right here in our own backyard in North Carolina. <coughs> I grew up as a zoo books and ranger writ kid in rural Alaska, loving the outdoors and wildlife. And here, with the red wolf, was a conservation story with a bit of everything. Extinction in the wild, a protagonist agency saving the day with a forward-thinking captive breeding program. The hero agency then reinstating the red wolf to its rightful place in the wild and then using the best science and management principles to bring back an otherwise extinct animal. For a science and outdoors geek like me, this had it all. When we learned about the Red Wolf in law school, it was not that the program was a failure. It was not that it was too challenging of a program to continue. Instead, back in 2012, the Red Wolf Recovery Program was used to teach about the reintroduction provisions of the Endangered Species Act and how the Red Wolf Program had become a model for other successful reintroduction efforts across the country. How things have changed in those six years. Since first learning about Red Wolves in law school, the protagonist of that conservation story has abandoned ship. What the service previously celebrated as a success the service now seems bent on dismantling because it has hit some bumps in the road to recovery. Instead of looking for solutions as it did in the past, the agency is giving up. Not too long ago, my parents visited from Alaska and I took them to see the Red Wolves at the Durham Museum of Life and Sciences. We probably spent about an hour just standing there outside the enclosure, lucky enough to catch the wolves during feeding time. The pups, there were four of them, were playing with their food. They were taking a little rat around and tossing it around and enjoying themselves. And the mother and father watched on. And it was just remarkable to watch these animals and imagine them in the wild. And that's all that I could keep thinking about, was how these animals belonged in the wild, not behind bars. Under the service's proposed rule, however, those red wolves that I watched, and others in captivity across the nation, will largely remain in their enclosures. The ones lucky enough to be released, as others have spoken to tonight, would be relegated to a space that could support about 10 to 15 wolves. And those wolves, of course, won't recognize the imaginary boundary between the refuge or federal lands and then the non-federal lands where once the wolf crosses that imaginary line, they suddenly can be shot and killed at will. The service, in essence, proposes to keep red wolves in zoos, or, and as one person put it, a canned hunting operation. The Fish and Wildlife Service knows how to save this species. You previously worked successfully with landowners, managed coyotes, and grew the population over the course of 30 years. The service should resume its role as conservation hero by abandoning its ill-conceived proposed rule and instead recommit to recovering this rare, beautiful animal. The service should implement alternative two as discussed in its draft environmental assessment. I hope that 10, 20, 30 years from now, my kids will learn about the Red Wolf Recovery Program in North Carolina as a success story, as I initially did, rather than a tale of how the US Fish and Wildlife Service failed the red wolf. Thank you. Ben Prater, next will be Scott McDaniel. That's Ben Prater, B-E-N-P-R-A-T-E-R. -E Good evening, I'm with Defenders of Wildlife, I'm the Southeast Program Director our organization represents over 40,000 members and supporters here in North Carolina. On their behalf, I'm here to express our opposition to the proposed 10-J rule for the wild red wolf population in eastern North Carolina. The preferred alternative presented this evening would effectively abandon the recovery effort and doom the species once again to extinction in the wild. The overarching goal 
of the Endangered Species Act is to preserve animal and plant communities in their natural habitat without both a captive and large-scale wild population, the red wolves' long-term odds of recovery are severely diminished. To recover the species, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must commit to Alternative 2, laid out in the environmental assessment, whereby the red wolf recovery area continues to be at least a five-county area, the red wolf adaptive management plan is re-implemented, Landowner agreements are established, authorized take is limited, and potential fines for unauthorized lethal take are also implemented. The unregulated take of red wolves outside of federal lands will prevent the growth of the population. Any transient individuals that leave the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge or Dare County Bombing Range could be killed without consequence. And as many have stated tonight, this is simply unacceptable. The new 10J rule must be revised to limit the take of these wolves, allowing endangered wildlife on private lands to be killed contradicts traditional notions of wildlife management. Private landowners do not own wildlife. Wildlife belongs to the public and should be managed for the public good. The Fish and Wildlife Service must make a concerted effort to consistently interface with all potentially affected landowners, <coughs> conduct seasonal outreach events and community forums, and work with NGOs like Defenders to design and implement landowner incentive and coexistence programs that have been proven to promote wolf recovery. The Fish and Wildlife Service must commit resources to stronger on the ground, non-lethal outreach initiatives that will help dispel popular myths, quell anti-government resentment, and reestablish a sense of trust within the Red Wolf Recovery Area, while enforcing poaching with the full strength of the Endangered Species Act. And I'd like to close by thanking the Fish and Wildlife Service for hosting this meeting and to acknowledge all of those in the service, past and present, dedicated to the conservation of the Red Wolf and to the recovery of all endangered species. Thank you. Scott McDaniel, and after that, Morgan Reeves. Uh, Scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, McDaniel, M-C-D-A-N-I-E-L. So I'm, I'm the Susquehanna Wildlife Society, and we are a nonprofit uh, based out of Lower Susquehanna in Maryland. So a pretty long ways away from here, you may wonder why I'm talking about wolves. We don't have any wolves in Maryland, haven't in some time. Um, we do have coyotes, however, and we do deal with the general public as far as uh, misconceptions about coyotes and, and potential um, having a top predator uh, in the ecosystem. Our organization deals a lot with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and uh, in our state, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So I'm, I'm used to working with state and, uh, and federal agencies. And, and I find they're nothing but wonderful people who have dedicated their lives. Uh, we don't do this for glory, right? We don't do it for money. Uh, we do it because we love wildlife. And the folks I've met that have worked on species like the red wolves, and I've met some of the folks and the biologists down here uh, in the refuges over the years I've visited, um, they've dedicated themselves to um, an idea, you know, a, a wilderness idea that we have here in America um, that we still hold, and some of us hold, and we're trying to and keep, keep alive. And, and I think for myself, um, we, we deal with species like the bog turtle, very small, um, not as imposing as a wolf may be. But uh, we've seen how working with private landowners, which most bog turtles are found on private lands, uh, much like the red wolf um, could be uh, if let uh, do what it wants to do. Um, there's a way of working together uh, without this fear and this resentment and misinformation. You know, we live in an era where um, I grew up believing in facts and science, and I always knew that there was a way that if I got the right book or talked to the right person, I could learn the truth. It seems that we don't have that anymore. It's just what people feel and what they think. They think wolves are bad. They think they kill all the deer. They think they do whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Um, but I, I trust in scientists and I trust in consensus and I trust um, in talking to people and understanding. You know, I want to understand the fears of the landowners and, and I want to see if it's justified or not. And if it isn't, then we talk about it and we find ways to work with them and we find ways to compromise um, while still doing what's right. At the end of the day, we have to do what's right. And 
uh, saving a species that is iconic as the red wolf. This is the American wolf. This is the wolf that the settlers saw when they came here, uh, that the Native Americans lived alongside. This isn't a throwaway species. This isn't some you know, invasive uh, European starling that, that came in accidentally or intentionally. Uh, sometimes they are. Um, this is a species that is as American as any of us um, would be. So it's worth saving for that reason alone. Um, and for me, it gets a little more personal than that. So once again, I come from Maryland, but I travel a lot. And I, I go to a lot of national parks and refuges. And um, ecotourism is a big reason, too, for having the wolf here. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to have since come down and enjoyed Alligator Rivers to see the dozens of bears that you can see in a single day, uh, potentially get a glimpse of a red wolf or a bobcat, see an American alligator at the northern end of this range, maybe a cottonmouth uh, at a distance. Uh, but it's a place where you can feel that wilderness that we've all lost in our urban areas and uh, suburban areas um, and internet uh, habits. So you can, you can experience these things that you, we've all lost. And the wolf is as wild as it gets. It's as wild as the rattlesnake, uh, which we focus on a lot up. Where I'm from is you know, talking about copperheads and venomous species, things that people don't like, but we need. They're part of the ecosystem, and in fact, probably the most important part of the ecosystem are the things that people are more afraid of. Um, but myself, I've come down here looking for the wolf, and I've been lucky enough to see not one, but two wolves in the wild here. And I've heard them howl in the night. And that feeling is not only stops your heart, but it makes you have this connection to a wilderness that we've lost and a humanity um, that we've lost. And that, that reason alone is worth saving, that every person could experience that in this country, we would live in a different country. And I feel that my son, and I'm not going to cry here, I'm going to try not to, he's not even a year old. And if, if he doesn't have a chance to see a wolf in the wild, I don't know how I'll feel. What a shame will that be? The, that because of a handful of landowners, we'll lose an entire species in the wild. Because of a handful of people that are misinformed, and that are afraid of, of something that has not heard of, per there's been two wolf attacks in like 200 years. Come on, people. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The fear and misinformation is, is just um, unacceptable. And, and we have to do a better job as educators and as government agencies and as nonprofits to help bring people in and to educate them and strengthen uh, our children so that they, they grow up wanting to protect these things. Um, my son will hear a wild red wolf in in North Carolina and hopefully maybe 10 other states where they should be. We need to rededicate ourselves and increase this population, not reduce it. Um, my organization supports um, option two uh, and to continue saving this wolf for all of us as American citizens. Thank you very much for your time. Morgan Freeze and after that will be Jeff Setzer. All right, my name is Morgan Fries. that's spelled M-O-R-G-A-N-F-R-E-E-S-E. -E -E. Now I'd like to say that it is the obligation of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to protect this endangered species, and that does not mean maintaining a captive population indefinitely. That means establishing them in a successful way in the wild for a self-sustaining wild population. Now, in order for that to happen, our red wolf population needs to increase, period, which it cannot do under the current proposed rule. The um, different alternatives included in the environmental, excuse me, environmental assessment, the one that is mostly being pursued right now is alternative three, and that will not allow for an increase in our wild red wolf population, and the captive breeding population in the species survival plan is currently at its limit. It also cannot increase under the current support that the species has. Now, not only do we need to increase the population, which the uh, different management strategies, the active man management strategies listed under alternative two in the environmental assessment would potentially allow for an increase in red wolf population, but additionally, we have to fight to protect the genetic diversity of this species that is critical for its future survival. And one of the things that is included in alternative three, which we are currently discussing, is the take of red wolves that have strayed from the soon to be shrunk under this plan, protection area and management area. Now, having wolves be released into the management area is one of the successes of this plan, but for wolves to be released into the managed area, then to have a natural spread throughout areas not protected under the management area, and then to be open to unrestricted take 
and unregulated take does not support the genetic diversity of the species and in fact may have negative consequences for it. Additionally, we know that breeding with coyotes, that interbreeding, happens more often when red wolves are killed during the breeding season. So knowingly allowing the wild red wolf population to be exposed to increases in gunshot mortality will have negative consequences for prospects of interbreeding with coyotes. I don't understand why that is considered to be a beneficial way to manage this endangered species. Finally, I am a resident of Deer County currently year round, and I've been a resident of North Carolina for most of my life. I came up through the public school system here and the public university system, and the Red Wolf success story was one of the things I was so proud of in fourth grade when I was hearing about North Carolina state history. I would hate now that I am a resident of North Carolina by choice rather than by my parents' choice of home for that to no longer be a reason for me to be proud of my state. And for those of you representing our state representatives at this meeting today, I would like to also point out that wildlife watching, not wildlife hunting, wildlife watching alone is a multi-million dollar industry in North Carolina. Tourism is one of the top industries here in our part of North Carolina. And having a self-sustaining wild red wolf population or an increasing wild red wolf population could be a really unique draw to this area for the thousands of people who travel within or to North Carolina for wildlife watching purposes. Thank you very much. Jeff Setzer, and at this time that's our last speaker. Jeff Setzer, it's J-E-F-F-S-E-T-Z-E-R. Um, wasn't really planning on speaking tonight, but I'm just kind of going to be all over the place. Um, but hopefully this kind of addresses the points that haven't mostly been talked about um, in regards to the rule. Obviously, at this point, like most people here, uh, opposed to the, the actual rule as it's currently stated. Um, I think the main reason that we saw a lot of opposition originally, I mean, I've been residing here for at least a, uh, six months to a year now, and I've been following the Red Wolf for at least three to four years, uh, well, more than that, at least seven to eight years now, and that's actually what brought me to North Carolina to begin with. And I think the biggest thing I've noticed ever since coming down here has been the, the landowners' issues with land rights, I think is where this mostly stems from. And the way that the the Red Wolf program is mostly being driven by these land rights issues. Um, I think we really need to find a way to work with them and whether that's through outreach, which has been already proposed in the local area here and it's I mean, hopefully spooling up and whether this is, I think it's mostly an issue and you all may be able to speak to it more, but an issue with I mean, funding. I mean, there's probably, I know from personal experience that Fish and Wildlife is very underfunded as with both administrations that we've had. And we need to be able to focus our efforts on reaching out to these landowners and just the local public. I mean, obviously, as people have probably mentioned and as I spoke last time when we had the coyote hunting public hearings, Ecotourism is huge, and that's driven, like I said, me down here. It's driven multiple people that we've seen down here. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we can focus our efforts with outreach to the public, and whether that's working with private organizations. I mean, there's multiple organizations here that have been more than willing and have already started moving people down here to actually work on this effort. So if funding's the issue, ask for help. Um, there's people out there that will help. So um, other than that, I think that, I mean, the Red Wolf, obviously the issue before with the original introduction of making it a distinct species or not, um, the effort, or the, uh, the ways of determining that back at the original uh, population obviously today is a little uh, outdated and there's literature going both ways and you guys are 
just as versed in this as anybody else or, um, that's been speaking tonight, most, or more so than we are. But it's still showing predominantly that it is a distinctive species, and that is an endangered species. Why we consider taking an endangered species is beyond me. I think we need to keep them in the wild outside of Alligator River. I don't understand why. I mean, I, we can focus efforts inside of the refuge if we have to, but why allow owners outside freely to take them? And I mean, we can work with them. We can bring in more people somehow or another, whether, like I said, whether it's a funding issue, we can work around that. We can get these red wolves back to the refuge or we can put them into Pocosin Lakes. There's other federal lands around here that we can work with. But if those few landowners that have issues, we can get them off their land. I don't see the issue there. Um, other than that, I, I hope that um, you all can come together with all this information and come with something a little better than, you know, let's just let them kill them off site, off the refuge, and that's the end of the story. That's it. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Seeing none, it's um, 8.55, and I declare this public hearing adjourned. Thank you.